Two months have passed. Where did they go? This is the question you ask at the end of your life. <laughs> Where did it all go? What? When I was a child, it was like, what's life all about? What's the meaning of it? What's the purpose? And now at the end of it, what happened to it? <laughs> yeah, just a memory. So always examining or in, in noting the present moment. It's like asking questions to yourself, like my the history of my life. What is it right now at this moment? So I'm sitting up in this high seat in this temple. You know, what is it that, what is of a lifetime, 70 years, pretty near, getting near 70? That's like uh, just asking oneself that question. Because uh, to establish this trust and awareness in the present. So you can ask yourself questions like that. What is life about? Or what? what is a lifetime about when you're 70? And so these aren't questions that you're interested in a kind of uh, analytical answer, any kind of... That's not the point, is it? But to just notice this bring attention into the present, that a lifetime is a concept. That I'm somebody that's 70 years old is a concept. That I've lived 70 years is another concept, a memory or a perception. Then what is the what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of a human lifetime? And then we can I, we can give very inspired kind of interpretations to become enlightened, to become a Buddha, to a Bodhisattva, or a Arahant, or a, uh, help the, help all sentient beings, or become a benevolent leader of. A, democratic country or a prophet or and all these are, these are all on the good side and then you know just to survive get through get what you can for yourself out of it more cynical <clears throat> so the purpose what is the purpose or meaning what is the meaning of life And so these these are questions that that stop the thinking mind. Because we 
we aren't really interested in kind of neat little answers or to the questions or trite kind of answers that, you know, just or just to be inspired by somebody. One can, you know, give a very, probably a good speaker could really, you know, say something incredibly inspiring at this time, uplifting. <coughs> But right now I'm only interested in the awareness, not in not in getting inspired. So even if even if you're the the even if you're depressed, totally disillusioned with monasticism at this time. It's in this moment, isn't it, that that is a condition that arises and ceases. The awareness, the knowing of it as is. So this is, the, this is what they call insight, knowledge. It's not knowing about, but knowing directly the way things are, the way it is. So lifetime, uh, my lifetime uh, is, uh, you know, why I could write uh, my autobiography. I wonder how many pages I could make out of my lifetime. A thousand pages, maybe? <laughs> maybe only a hundred, I don't know. I'm too, I don't even want to bother to think about it. Or is it just this moment? So the result of a lifetime lived as a Buddhist monk. Most of my life I've been a Buddhist monk. And the, the result is a total trust in the present. You know, this, is, this is all there ever is, here and now. Birth is now, enlightenment is now, death is now. So in the birth in terms of becoming somebody, you know, the, like a mental birth, or death, or enlightenment. So like on a full moon of May when we have the Wesak festival and that celebrate the birth, enlightenment, and death. Is this for historical, is this historically accurate, you know, the, could uh, anyone be born on the full moon of May and be enlightened on the full moon of May and die on the full moon of May? You know, the logic or rationale that we, we like, we, that we, we have a sense for history, for chronology. Or is it mo more profound than just that, of trying to, to have an accurate Chronology in regards to the actual dates and times of the Buddha's birth, enlightenment, and death. Or reflecting that there's only this now, this in terms of experience, being, consciousness, knowing. Remembering the past, remembering the past, recalling the experiences of one life, or of <clears throat> plans for the future, worries, fears, dreads, anticipation about the future. It's always now. So in, in practice, I mean really the direct meditation practice then is, is learning to establish this sense of presence, of being present now. As soon as you think you've got to attain something out of it, like we usually, we've got to get our samadhi together, then when, you know, we're grasping an idea of in the future of doing something now to attain uh, some desirable 
concept. So I encourage you to trust this this very direct way of of the uh, of opening to the present. Because the samadhi comes through trusting and resting in the present, not through attaining something that you think is samadhi or this uh, state of concentration. emphasizing the the limitation of speech, you know, thinking, again, I repeat, that because we are thinking beings, we think. Rodin's sculpture of the thinker and of the gates of hell, because hell is thinking. And that you can create, you can create the hell just by thinking, worrying. What is worry? It's thinking about what if this happens or it doesn't happen, or what if I get cancer? What if I? Uh, who's going to take care of me in my old age? What's going to happen, Dhammavati, when I die? Uh, future is the unknown, you know, anything could happen. Will people bring food tomorrow? Will, they, will the pe- lame and living here, will they bother to go into the kitchen and cook for us? <laughs> I c- we could worry about that tonight if you want. We take it for granted, don't we? We just take them for granted, they're going to do it. <clears throat> But it's still unknown now, isn't it? Not even they know they're going to do it. They probably think they will. <clears throat> so this is like exploring the present moment in terms of, you know, huh? What is what? What is worth? It's people worry a lot in countries like this. You know, in a country that that has dedicated its all its efforts to trying to make life seem secure and safe as much as possible, but we still endlessly worry and complain because it's it could always it always could be better. You know, I could always. You know, no matter, even if, if Britain became just the most efficient, well-run, democratic, fair, just, tolerant country in the whole world, I could still think of what it could be better than this. And that's how thought works. And you don't find contentment through thinking about things, but through reflecting you know, so like contentment is the point of the monastic life, being content with little. So you, you know, you're you're not spending your life always trying to get the better things or get more or the best, but you 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 appreciate the the simplicity and what is offered, what is made available to us. And that's a reflective way of thinking, not not, not just a thinking about how, what we want to eat tomorrow, or if we can make sure that we're going to be guaranteed meals every day till we die. Or, you know, have written contracts, signed contracts, and make sure that, that I've got my, you know, I'm guaranteed safety and security and all the best till I drop dead. Becoming a monk, a uh, nun is taking a risk. You know, it's a risky life. As you, you're throwing yourself out of the structures of society into the unknown. And that's what it's about, go, going forth, a bapacha, 
you know, when we say go forth, you're going out into the unknown. So anything could happen. Anything might happen. Uh, it might be a total disaster, one's life is a samana. <clears throat> it's a risk. Because the, the future is the unknown, that's just the way it is. Or sometimes, you know, people, you know, samanas, they get despairing, or life in monasteries gets dreary, or there's disharmony, and everybody starts complaining, and then, uh, am I wasting my life? You know, I could have been prime minister of Britain. I could have been president of the United States. I could have. I could have been a great uh, rock star or actor or something. Then I, I took the risk and look at this quarreling bunch of samanas, monks and nuns, and grumbling and complaining, and then I'm wasting my life. Then bringing back into the present. The sense of wasting a life or wanting something to be some, uh, the way it's, uh, not wanting to, something to be the way it is. The resentment that arises when, when the conventions that we live in, the group or the people that we live in aren't, you know, can't sustain themselves in the, in the way that, that please us. And life changes. So the, the, the thinking mind, the sense of myself as a personality, is very much would like security and safety, certainty. The ideal monastery where full of dedicated samanas who live in total harmony and are content and practice and have attained, have realized the path and things like this, this would be the ideal. So then, uh, that's, remember that's an ideal and then if we, if we, if that's what we give our allegiance to, to our ideals, then what we have now doesn't quite live up to that, so then we, we complain. We think in the future, maybe I can make everything happen to where uh, I can make my ideal come true. Hope and expectation, we, or longing, and that's something we create in the present. So it's exploring, investigating one's the mind itself. Consciousness is like this. The four elements, earth, fire, water, and air. You know, so just these basic elements are, you know, to, to uh, begin to just notice the, the, what we're living with before it becomes, you know, before it turns into forms and conditions that uh, are, um, you know, that we can become attracted to or averse to. So using the four elements, the solid element, earth element, liquid element or fluid element, water, the air and fire, as it applies to this body, the body is the four elements. And what we see and experience through our senses, through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind is, uh, is the elements, space and consciousness. So the form the world is, is the earth, fire, water, and air, 
space is now, isn't it? Space is the, you know, when we contemplate space, we withdraw our attention to the form and notice that which is around the form, that surrounds the form, this space. Infinite. Space has no boundary. Earth, fire, water, and air are always in forms, or bound, have limitations and boundaries. Space, in terms of experience now, it has no boundary. I mean, you have the walls of the temple, but then you realize that space is, the temple is in space. So just reflecting on the way it is. Space, you know, visual space. Not just abstract uh, concept of space. Consciousness. And that thoughts arise and cease. Feelings. Sensations. Sensory uh, impingement arises and ceases, but in co- consciousness is always present. So, in, when thinking ceases, when stop thinking, when feeling ceases, what's left is is consciousness. But consciousness has no boundary. So you're just n- noticing infinity or immeasurable, boundless reality. And the, then the forms and conditions that arise and cease, thoughts arise and cease, they're forms, emotions that we have, being happy or sad or angry or jealous or frightened or greedy or lustful. They arise according to conditions. You know, you can't be lustful all the time. It, and the conditions for lust, then, the, then the, it feels like this. Rises, ceases, anger rises, ceases, fear, jealousy, they all come and go. So I don't know if I'm making sense at all. Some of you, I mean, when you know, when you're talking about the present, here and now, unconditioned reality, you know, like what what is a fact? Something that is is uh, true at this moment not just an abstract theory or an idea that we make up. So when we, the fact, it's this way, the way it is. And so that, that, that very sentence is a reflective way of thinking, the way it is. It's not a statement. If I say, if I make a fatalistic statement like, well, that's the way life is, you know. As if it, it, life is miserable, let's face it, that's the way it is. That's not it. Because that's a statement made out of, uh, of an emotion. But a reflective thought isn't coming from an emotion. It's not an emotional statement, it's a pointing. The way it is, is like this. Right now, this moment, here and now, is this way. So you're open to it, isn't it? Being present. And then you're thinking, what is he saying? What way is it now? What am I supposed to be looking for? Because, you know, we usually like to define the way it is. Tell me the way it is right now, Ajahn Sumedho, you know. Well, it's just the way it is. (laughs) And so I was just encouraging you to notice like this, being conscious. The sense realm is like this. Having a body is like this. 
personality. You know, if I'm having, you know, feeling very strongly emotional, it brings up my sense of my me as a person, what I love and what I feel and what I long for and aspire to and what I'm frightened of and my feelings. Uh, you know, that, that, that kind of part of oneself that feels frightened or angry or hopeful is like this. So by using thought in this way to point to the present, to establish this present, so that you, and to notice the way it is, isn't de de defining the way it is, it's learning to trust in this intuitive awareness. No, it's, it's not defining it, it's awakening to it. So by intuitive awareness, then it's, since it's not, it needn't take any form, you don't need to, uh, you know, it isn't a, it's not preferring or saying how things should be, but it certainly allows us to be fully with the way it is that for each one of us as we experience this present moment in our own unique ways. So if what I'm saying puzzles you, you know, what the hell is he talking about? Be aware of that. You know, being baffled is like this. Or not liking, and I don't agree with him, he's crazy, it's like this. You know, whatever. I'm not asking you to agree with me or like what I'm saying, but encouraging this this awareness, so you begin to not just react to life, but notice the reactions that that you're having are like are the way they are. So being confused or not knowing or baffled is like this. So when I when I do this, it's just it, I find it right, like right now, just this sense of the way it is. It's like this. I feel having practiced like this for so many years, then it's it's uh, easily established this awareness, and I stop struggling with it, trying to figure it out, and and uh, because the 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 uh, thinking mind always wants to do something with it. There's always something to do or figure out or analyze or, you know, that, that's the way the, the, uh, the habit tendencies are. But now, through being aware of that, they don't, have, they don't take me over. But it does take patience with, in, in meditation is, uh, is the, is the, is the uh, experience of patience Patience with the thinking mind or the emotional uh, habits that one has with the physical body. Then learning to trust in this awareness. Uh, trust it. No, like you, you know, I, through through um, contemplating this for many years. You know what? What else is there to trust? Somebody's idea. You know, should I trust the scriptures? the Tripitaka, or should I trust a, a, a great teacher, take refuge in, a, in what a great teacher says, or uh, should I trust in uh, Amravati, or Theravada, or 
Do I take refuge in Theravada or what? What do I what what can you really trust that isn't something you're creating, a perception, you know, that that comes and goes? So you ask yourself, what is it at this moment that's totally trustworthy? My personality I can't trust at all. My personality changes all the time, you know. It, it likes and dislikes and it gets fussy and grumpy and all that. I can't trust anything like that. Can't trust my emotions. Because when people praise me, you know, my emotions go whoop. And when they criticize me, they go, they plummet down to the bottom. How can you trust your emotional habits? Because they, they're, you know, they're so, they're always like yo-yos going up and down. And if you don't get any criticism or any praise, you just get bored, personally. <laughs> Nobody even notices you. They don't even care. There's nothing to criticize or praise at all. That's an insult. So, can't take refuge in my personality, my emotional habits, body. Take refuge in, you know, that, that's a hopeless one. In a human body. Thank you. Very mindful, this guy. So, what is it then? And so it's this awareness, isn't it? Because in spite of, you know, I, the awareness uh, isn't, isn't, no, it's discerning, it's aware of the rising, ceasing. It knows that anger arises when it's arisen, when it's ceases and when there's uh, when the thoughts come in the mind and when reactions when I react to things is like this so where the body the awareness uh, is aware of the body as experienced now and you can be aware in it bring a, attention to the body it's breathing inhaling exhaling it's it's feeling, it's heaviness, it's, it, it's sensations. The body is here and now. The breath is here and now. Consciousness here and now. Sensory experience here and now. So the awareness is, you know, in, in uh, Pali terms, there, the aramana is the object, the, in, in subject and object. So the aramana is is this a poly term for the for the object objects like thoughts are objects personality is an object because you can witness your personality you can you can witness to your emotional feeling in the present so what is it that witnesses the subject the pure subject or absolute subject is the refuge. So meditation then, as we, you know, if we're developing the path, the Eightfold Path, and that implies this, always the learning to recognize this absolute subjectivity, this pure presence of being here and now. Not try you, you can't find it. You have this is why it is an act of faith. Relax into it, trust it. Accept, receive. This this is the words that help that might be more useful than trying to get samadhi. Because that is uh, like then I I try to get something I don't have. It doesn't help me to to trust in the refuge. It just makes me want something that I don't have yet. 
So trusting this, uh, is, it doesn't seem like much of anything. Doesn't you know? Doesn't because you can't get behind it. It's not an arom. Aramana. So in the Thai forest tradition, the Bhutto, the one who knows, the Puru, the witness, resting in that, you know, the way it is. It's a discerning, but it's not a critical. It's not saying what should or shouldn't be or what's right or wrong, but it, it's aware of the way it is. Fear is like this. Anger is like this. The physical body right now is like this. So this way of establishing awareness is breaks down all these uh, the the conventions that we tend to take refuge in. So. You know, like our language, our thoughts, our memories, <clears throat> our ideas, our opinions and views, uh, perceptions of time and reality, the real world, as they say. What is the real world? And uh, the, the conventional world that, that we regard as reality, we begin to see that it's not real. That the uh, you know the human population lives in the unreal, in the illusions that they create. So you're you know you're beginning to trust in this refuge. So it's a refuge to spend more time in to to if there is such a thing as time, just to keep referring to it. As soon as you you know the when you're traveling off into the future or worrying, re- regretting things about the past and so forth, and as soon as you see yourself caught in these patterns of guilt and shame and regret and anger and resentment about the past or worry about the future, then it's a chance that it was like this to begin to, not to just deny that or suppress it, but use it. The more you turn to it, not through criticizing or analyzing, but through discerning it, it's like this. So when when I get worried, you know, I worry, what's going to happen tomorrow? I uh, wonder if it'll rain or not. And then I find myself you know, creating worried perceptions in the present, then I catch myself saying, oh, worry. Like, and I begin to notice in the body or the, just the mood of this kind of, this uh, kind of shakiness, the kind of unpleasantness of, not maybe not any great worry, but these little niggling, petty things that hang around one's consciousness. So it, it, notice this, oh, this this shakiness, the way that it, the, that one one's life can be just a continual kind of reproduction of of just anxiety and worry and restlessness and and resentment and things like this, longing, re- grumbling, complaining. And we can just reproduce these endlessly, you know, and live in, and it's a hell realm, isn't it? It's really pretty nasty to spend a lifetime, you know, creating these these conditions over and over. Contemplating this, uh, this is the what I encourage you to do for the remaining month of the Vasa and for the rest of your life. Who uh, this is 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 very worthy. 
Because it is to me, you know, from from perspective from my life as a monk, it's been a life well spent. You know, it's a, I don't I haven't wasted my life. And it's uh you know, so it's uh something I feel very uh, pleased about, you know, the opportunity to live such a life. Um, at this time and in this country. Because to me this is what, you know, what's worth, this is my opinion, what, 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 what's worth knowing is this, the way it is, the Dhamma. <clears throat> and the, the, um, the conventional world is is the way it is. So sometimes it's quite nice, sometimes it's not. You know, societies change, go through various cycles of of, uh, of development and decadence. <clears throat> but in in just as one self, one's body, you know, is young and vigorous and middle aged and then old and uh, gets feeble and dies so so this is uh, the the what uh, condition phenomena does it's nature birth and death beginning and ending Encouraging this this trust in the awareness of it of this you know this this is difficult one to get across I find because uh, it is a, a kind of an imminent act and, and it is uh, you know if you've got a of a, a doubting uh, critical mind it, it's rather frightening. But what else is there to trust except one's own experience? You know, you can tell me all about yours or Lung Po Cha or, or great teachers and uh, can give me all kinds of advice, which is very good. You know, but in the, in the, at the end of the day, I'm here. This is it. This this awakeness is in here. It's not I can't because Ajahn Chah was awake. You know I can't depend on his awakeness to for me as a refuge. So this is to explore what is awakeness. Sati Sampachanya, right now. You know not don't go to the Pali dictionary. Just. Trust yourself to, to recognize it. And then confidence in that. You know, you can, you can experiment, you can investigate it. Test it out. What comes and goes and what stays at this moment. This is like this is sharing with what way I've practiced for all these years, just investigating, questioning, so that these things, be, you know, are very clear and very accurate in terms of of, of discernment. When you when you begin to tr- when you recognize that this is the only thing you can trust. So then the sattā, or this sense of releasing into this faith, into this trust. The moon jantu satang, when I chant the aparuta de sangamatasata orai sodavanta, the moon jantu satang. The gates to the deathless are open. Those that hear are aware. Trust this. 
บำรุงจันทุเร release relax into the with faith จัดตั้งอย่าง Buddhist world you all know there's so many views and opinions so what I'm saying is uh, You know, don't grasp it as a view or opinion. It's for reflection, for encouragement, not for belief. You know, so remember how Krishnamurti used to get so angry because the, the people would uh, he keep giving all these wise lectures, and then people just repeat, you know, what Krishnamurti said. He says, I don't. I'm not a teacher. <laughs> like Monty Python, you know, our teacher is a teacher who's not a teacher. <laughs> the technique, uh, meditation technique, or uh, methods, things like this, you know, the uh, any of these conventions will. Be useful if you have the right attitude. But if you're grasping all these things and out of ignorance, then you know it, you're going to be disappointed. So the, the the encouragement is to trust. In the beginning, awakeness is now, v i c h a or right knowledge is now, purity is now. The deathless is now. The unconditioned is now. So this, now, what does that do for you? What do you mean unconditioned? Define the unconditioned. <laughs> And how do you know if it's unconditioned? Maybe you're just deluding yourself, s a m a d o The unconditioned is now. What are you talking about? I don't see anything unconditioned. What is it? Because So that you know, when, when you think about it, you you you, uh, you know you just get caught in doubt, which is kicha. So what is beyond thinking at this moment? The awareness of thinking, attention, openness, apperception. You know, intuitive awareness. That embraces this moment as is, with all that uh, its uh, qualities, pleasant or unpleasant. So just by by investigating in this way, you you can you see you know this for yourself is something that. That isn't a matter of belief. Not asking you to believe, but to notice the way it is. Or recognize, or realize. So, I offer this as a reflection for this evening. <clears throat>